Well, please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. We continue our studies in this letter uh, or epistle of the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. Continuing to make our way through this letter, today we come to chapter 5. We're actually going to be looking at verses 3 through 7 this morning, but I want us to give our attention to, or as we read it, uh, to, to begin with verse 1, just to get a little bit of sense of the context. I took verses 1 and 2 last week with the end of chapter 4. They really kind of link to what goes before, but they also, it's kind of a transitional. They kind of point to what's coming in the passage we'll look at today. So hear the word of God, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners, uh, as the earlier ESV says, do not associate, I think the stronger reading, the revision is a good one, do not become partners with them. So we give thanks to God for his holy word. Let's pray now. Our Father, we turn to you. As we turn to your word, this is your word, and it is truth itself. Father, we pray that you would lead us into a good understanding of the passage today. Father, we need your help. These things are spiritually discerned, and even as believers, even made new, even alive, Lord, how slow we can be to understand, how slow we can be to receive and grasp what you have for us here, and certainly, Lord, to act on it appropriately. Uh, so, Father, we pray that you grant us repentance. We pray that you would pour on us your grace. We pray, Father, that uh, you would give us grace to pursue obedience to you, obedience to your word. Father, our souls are hungry. It's been a while since we were here in worship. We pray, Lord, that you would feed us on the word of God, nourish us, Lord, as food nourishes the body, that the truths of your word and the grace it conveys and the Savior to whom it points would nourish, be a feast to our souls. Father, we thank you, and we worship you as we think about your word. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We return now to a section of, of this epistle to the Ephesians where Paul is applying the great truths that he wrote about in the first part of the book, uh, salvation that he describes there that is by Christ alone, uh, in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in, in Jesus, and of course all to the glory of God alone. It's God who saves. But that that salvation makes a difference in our lives in tangible and practical and evident ways. You cannot be chosen by God. You cannot be redeemed by the blood of the Son of God. You can't be made alive by the Holy Spirit and continue to live as you always did. Certainly can't go on living in, wallowing in, embracing sin. Of course, we will still sin. We won't be sinless this side of heaven, this side of glory. But the difference is we repent of sin, we hate our sin, we seek to put off our sin and replace it with Christ-like obedience and humility and holiness. That's what marks us as Christians, not perfection. We're not there yet. But that we do repent and that we do look to Jesus for forgiveness and by his grace seek to live in ways that honor him. Paul has already given several practical applications of this good news, the gospel of Jesus, and we've looked at that already, but now he turns our attention to this whole matter of sex. 
Now, the culture alone would be reason enough for Paul to turn his pen to address this question of sexual immorality and the Christian, the Greco-Roman culture of the first century, the time in which Paul lived, the time in which his readers here, those who read this letter, the time in which they lived, uh, lived in a culture and it was uh, as, as morally and sexually confused and debauched as is our own, possibly worse, although I'm not sure they actually had a Pride Month designated in which officially to celebrate their debauchery, they just did it. But there's another reason, not only the culture, another reason Paul may have gone there. We saw last time, and we read uh, in verses 1 and 2, where Paul urges them, and us, of course, to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Uh, love. That we're to love one another as, as Jesus has loved us. And I suspect then, and certainly know now, much sexual immorality and debauchery and perversion is given a pass under the name of love. We've all seen that in our culture. The slogan, love wins, isn't actually about love at all, but about pushing the culture to accept sexual sin as normal, as healthy, as good. After all, who can be opposed to love, right? So when Paul mentions love in verse 2, maybe thinking about love and Christ-like, a selfless, sacrificial, giving kind of love, Maybe his brain thought about the opposite of that, a perversion of love. It's all about taking, a degradation of love, justifying sin in the name of love. And, and his argument here is, in short, we should glorify God in everything, including our view of sex. How so? Well, Paul gives us here two ways. First, he says our view of sex should reflect who we are in Christ. Everything should be affected by who we are in Christ, including our understanding of human sexuality, our view of it, practice of it, expression of our own sexuality as males, females, made in the image of God. But Paul starts here with this contrast between how we are to love one another, as he says, which is how Christ loved us selflessly, sacrificially, and then by contrast, the degradation of love in immorality. I don't think uh, that there's a complete disconnect between verse 2 to verse 3. One is actual love, and the other is a perversion of love. Now, we need to understand, of course, that biblically, the expression of that sexuality, we're all made, male or female, that's the two options, that's it, male or female, male sex, female sex, and God made us that way, and the expression of our sexuality in its consummation is something God designed and instructed to incur only in the context of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. That is how God designed it, and that's how it works. And, of course, all, everything other than that is sinful. But we also need to understand the consummation of that sexual relationship is not the highest of all human experiences or even human relationships. Why do I say that? I mean, our culture just seems, on the one hand, seems to exalt it very highly as an idol. On the other hand, so debases it as something nothing and commonplace, both at the same time, which is weird. But no, it's not the highest of all things. It will not exist in heaven. Jesus tells us that uh, in, in, when he's discussing with the, the Sadducees the state of marriage and, and what things will be like in the resurrection. Remember, whose husband will she be? Uh, none. There's no giving in marriage in heaven. He doesn't say we will be angels. He says we will be like angels, not marrying, not reproducing, and so forth. Uh, and in fact, there is something to be said uh, for a godly singleness as approaching closer, a godly singleness with healthy, deep relationships, approaching more closely what we will all experience in heaven than the married life here. So something we need to keep in mind. And that's certainly not to diminish 
the sexual relationship of marriage. It's a God-given way for married couples expressing their love for each other, celebrating covenant of marriage, and of course, conceiving and raising children. But know this. Remember this. It will help you a lot. Sex is not ultimate. Jesus is ultimate. Jesus is ultimate. And to honor Jesus, our commitment has to be no sex outside of marriage and sex only within marriage. So Paul addresses a couple of things here pertaining to sex gone wrong in, the, in verses 3 and 4. One is, is sinful behavior. We might think of that most obviously, verse 3. He says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. When our daughter was very small, I must have preached on this topic, or we came, maybe it was this passage, uh, or a passage in scripture that made reference to sexual immorality. Because she and Barbara and Caleb were, were driving home. I mean, we've always come in two cars because I come over here early on Sunday mornings. And they were driving, so many thanks to Barbara for fielding the questions after the sermon on the drive home. So they were driving home, and, and Barbara reported this to me, that Rebecca pipes up, you know, little girl in the car, says, sexual immorality, Mom, what is it? Well, in case some of you children are wondering, I will explain very carefully. God gave mothers and fathers married to each other a special way to show love to each other. Sexual immorality is when they show that special kind of father and mother married love to someone they're not married to. God says that is wrong. The Bible calls it sexual immorality. Actually, the word Paul uses here is porneia, uh, which refers to sexual sin generally. You will, of course, recognize from it the word pornography, uh, and maybe not as obviously with a consonant shift, for which analysis you can thank Grimm's Law of the Grimm brothers and the fairy tales, but the same, they were linguists, Grimm's Law, describing how a P becomes an F, pater becomes father, and porneia becomes fornication, sexual sin. That's the word Paul uses here, pretty general. Uh, any kind of, of sexual activity outside of marriage. Impurity, pretty broad word uh, that could cover a lot of things, but in context refers to uncleanness of a sexual nature, and Paul often uses these two terms uh, together, and then covetousness. Well, you think that's a head scratcher. Does that really even fit? But again, in context, Paul is probably referring to, uh, as one commentator describes it, unrestrained sexual greed, whereby a person assumes that others exist for his or her own gratification. The very opposite of the kind of Christ like love that we saw in verse 2. Uh, and so it's true that the, also that the 10th commandment, Exodus 20, when it's talking about coveting, the 10th commandment, coveting, you shall not covet, specifies, among other things, coveting of a sexual nature. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. So for Paul to apply the word coveting in this context fits perfectly with that commandment back in Exodus 20. So Paul says such things must not even be named among you. What does he mean? Some people have taken Paul to mean we shouldn't even talk about it. Shouldn't say anything about it. Don't mention it. Well, if that was the case, Paul just violated his own instruction because after all, he brought it up, right? And so I, I suspect that's not what he's talking about. If it is, that would put me in violation of that, but it would also put Paul in violation of that. In fact, it would mean we couldn't even read or the passage or preach on a passage like this one. So that kind of puts us in a weird place. So what is he talking about? I, I, I don't think that's what he's saying. Uh, this expression must not even be named is just a kind of an idiom, a way of saying these things should never occur among Christians, among people of God. We should not be guilty of them. Another writer explains it this way. He says, Paul is asserting that these sins should be so universally absent from the body of believers that there should be no occasion to associate them with the church. In other words, people should think of Christians, should think of churches as a place where this doesn't occur. And what a witness and what an example that would be and should be. It ought to be to our 
to our world. Uh, the NIV, I think, translates it well. It says, among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. And Paul goes on to add, as is proper among holy people. The word he uses is saints, or it's translated saints. Literally, it's holy ones, those who are holy, not super Christians like the Roman Catholic Church tends to use the word saints. But the, the Bible uses this term to refer to Christians because every Christian is a holy one in Christ Jesus. We are holy before God in Christ and striving to be holy in the way that we actually do live. And so Paul says these things shouldn't even be named. There should be no hint of them among the holy people of God. That holiness should define us. And so these kinds of sexual sins, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, pornography, uh, as well as coveting of a sexual nature, which we have a word for that, lust, essentially, should have no place in your life or mine, in the life of the believers. And yet, it's the water we swim in, isn't it? And it's awfully hard not to be affected by it. Our thinking is shaped by what we watch and hear and read. Our attitudes, even our behavior, can be eroded by the constant current of the culture around us. And so the pressure is on outwardly, and perhaps because of our own fallen natures, inwardly to go along. Which makes us like the people Paul wrote this letter to. Christians living in a sin corrupted, sin-saturated society. The reality is, if it ever did, certainly not now, the culture will not encourage you in sexual holiness, holiness of any sort, but certainly not of a sexual nature. Your friends, your acquaintances may not either. And so we have to resolve as Christians, that we are going to, by God's grace, with his help, honor Christ in this whole area of our sexuality. As Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, Corinth, a place whose name to Corinthianize meant to engage in sexual immorality, so vile was that city, its very name became a word for it. As Paul wrote to that church, a body of Christians like you or me living in that place, as he wrote these words, he said, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? He's writing to Christians. Your body is a Holy Spirit, temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Paul cuts through one of the biggest arguments for sexual sin there is, and it's my body. You're a Christian. It's not your body. Jesus bought it with his own blood. Your body... Your mind, your heart, all of you belongs to Jesus if you are a Christian. And if you're married, secondarily, your body belongs to your husband or your wife. 1 Corinthians 7, different sermon. But your body belongs to God, to Jesus who bought it. Your body is not your own to do with whatever you want. You belong to Jesus if you're a Christian, and so you do what Jesus says with your body. So glorify God in your body. Paul also wrote on a similar theme to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 4. Again, not Corinth, but still that same culture. He said, this is the will of God, your sanctification. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Lots of people, what is God's will for my life? Your God's will for your life is that you be holy. That's what sanctification means. Your sanctification, specifically, he goes on, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality. I'll just stop there. I'm going to go on with that passage, but just point out, you know, Martin Luther said, you know, that, that if we're not addressing the gospel 
uh, at, the, at the point of where the battle is in the culture, then we're, then we're missing it. And this is where the battle is. I mean, yes, there's lots of ways you can be sanctified. You can deal with self-righteousness. You can deal with pride. You can deal with you know, a sharp tongue or a lack of compassion. But let's face it, the war in our culture today is over sexuality and sexual identity and all those things. You know it as well as I do. And so do you want to be radical? Do you want to live counterculturally? Be holy. Be pure in the matter of your sexuality. That, that is, Paul says, sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. And then he continues a couple of verses later. For God has called us not for impurity, but in holiness. There's that word again, impurity. The contrast, holiness. God has not called us for impurity. That's not what he saved you for. But in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man. You're not disregarding me, the preacher. You're not disregarding you know, your parents. You're disregarding God. Whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you, to help you, to empower you. This is God's word. This is not Alan, the preacher. This is not your elders. This isn't your parents. This isn't, you know, your, your friend. This, this is God speaking, who designed and gave us our sexuality and designed how it's supposed to work. God's reasoning in all of this is, is not to take away joy, but to give joy. Look around you. How many people living in sexual sin are characterized by joy? Real joy, real happiness, real delight in life. Is there any reason depression and anxiety are at an all-time high? A lot of reasons for that. But I suspect giving oneself over to sexual sin contributes to that. By the way, I'm, I'm not here, and the Bible's not here, to lay a guilt trip on you other than maybe to drive you to Jesus, drive you to repentance and faith and trust in Jesus, to receive and believe Jesus' promise of forgiveness for his blood shed for your sexual sin and my sexual sin. Outwardly, possibly, certainly every one of us of the heart. And remember, the heart sin also violates the command. None of us is righteous here. But to believe the promise of God, to believe his forgiveness, to believe his blood is capable. We can't undo the past. Can't go back and undo it. But Jesus forgives the past and Jesus makes all things new. And then to honor him in our bodies and honor him in our minds. After all, Jesus bought us. Our bodies belong to him and we want to honor him. So Paul certainly is concerned about sinful behavior here in this area, but he's also concerned about sinful speech. And we see this in verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. Now, we could take those generally, just talk about speech that dishonors God, that, that doesn't help anybody, but Paul already talked about that earlier. Remember, we talked about that, the kind of speech that builds up one another, and so in context, I do think he is talking here about filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking of a sexual nature. And the same rule he stated earlier applies, that, that what we say should be uh, intended to not degrade others or tear them down or harm them, but to uplift them, to build them up, to be a source of grace to those who hear us. So in the context, I think the kind of speech he's talking about here is, is dirty jokes, is crude talk, crude terms, that sort of thing. We want to give grace to those who hear. But the alternative, Paul says, is let there be thanksgiving. Now again, generally, maybe, but maybe thanksgiving for the whole, this whole area of our sexuality. Rather than misusing it and speaking uh, filthy ways about it, Give thanks to God for it. Honor him in, the way, in where you are, whether single or married, where you are in life. But thanksgiving to God generally for all his blessings that he gives to us. Uh, Paul does kind of make a play on words here. Uh, crude joking is eutrophilia. Thanksgiving is eucharistia. Eucharist, you, you hear, we know that word, the Lord's Supper. Charis in the middle, grace. Uh, the word for grace is right in the middle of it. So some translate it gracious speech. So the play on words, instead of crude joking, thanksgiving. 
Uh, it's the replacement for corrupting speech back in verse 29, gracious speech, speech rooted in God's grace, but speech that also conveys grace to others. Now, that doesn't mean we can only ever talk about Jesus, but it does mean that Jesus hears and motivates uh, the way that we do talk about whatever we're talking about so that we're aiming to honor him and build up the other person and do them good. So first, our view of sex, both in behavior and how, even how we talk about it, should reflect who we are now in Christ. Just like everything else Paul has been talking about, this isn't moralism, this is be now who you are as a new creation in Christ Jesus, forgiven, born again in him. But the second thing, not only should reflect who we are in Christ, but second, our view of sex should reflect who God is in his holiness. See this in verses 5 through 7. Paul says, you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And here Paul repeats the same terms that he used earlier back in verse 3, back in verse 4, uh, sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, which he says is idolatry. He does that in Colossians as well. He says greed, which is idolatry. Why? Why is it? Well, because it's putting something, uh, maybe it's money or illicit relationships before God and what he has for us. It's putting that over God. In fact, some have said any time we break one of the Ten Commandments, we're breaking the first. You shall have no other gods before me because to sin in any other way is to put ourselves as God over God. So you could say any time we sin, we commit idolatry in a sense. We make ourselves the arbiter of what is right and wrong. Now, what Paul is not saying, Paul's not saying here that anyone who's guilty in these areas is lost, cannot be saved. That's not what he's saying. Nor is he saying that someone who incurs guilt in these areas, uh, even as a believer, can't repent and be saved, be forgiven. Uh, in fact, it's precisely for these sins that Jesus came. Precisely why Jesus came into the world. Jesus said, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for sinners. And he meant real sinners who actually do commit real sin. And what he is saying is that those who embrace this immorality and filthy talk, those whose lives are unashamedly and unabashedly characterized by it, they're not in the kingdom. Regardless of what they say, regardless of what they profess, if, if this is the water they happily swim in, they're not in the kingdom. They're not saved. They have no inheritance. Paul used that word earlier in, Act, in, in Ephesians 1. You know, our inheritance kept for us, uh, the Holy Spirit assures us of. They don't have it if this is how they prefer to live. Paul does continue. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. It's kind of just a Hebrew expression. It means those characterized by this kind of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Notice how he goes here. He says, let no one deceive you. There's that word deceive again. It's popped up before. The very essence of temptation and sin is deception. Satan is the deceiver, the father of lies. The lie, of course, is that sin will do you good. Genesis 3, the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil would be great. Best thing ever. Uh-uh. That's a lie. It's deception. But we fall for it every time we sin. We think, if I sin, I'll be better off. God says, no, you won't be better off. And we learn that the hard way, and yet sometimes we never quite seem to learn it adequately. But deception, the truth is sin will destroy you. It'll make you miserable now. It'll destroy you. And there's a lot of deception going on in this area. A lot of people are deceived. Um, it's possible Paul was writing in the face of some very early Gnosticism that said, you know, your soul matters, your body doesn't matter, what you do with your body really doesn't matter, so do whatever you want with your body. That's a lie. The body does matter. Jesus died to redeem the body, not just the soul. Today, of course, the deception is that your body's your own. You can do whatever you want with it. God's irrelevant. Or maybe worse, God approves of sexual immorality. He approves of love, whatever form that might take. 
Uh, this is the argument of, of mainline churches, mainline denominations that have abandoned biblical sexuality and many other things biblical, but biblical sexuality to follow the world. They celebrate what God condemns is sin. It's a lie. Don't listen to the world. Don't listen to apostate churches that claim to speak for God, but in truth are synagogues of Satan, spreading lies, serving Satan in the name of Christ, in the name of God. We need to hear again, not what they say, not what the world says, but what Paul says here, of course, 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? What does he mean by unrighteous? Do not be deceived. There's that word again. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty plain. It also is convicting. Is there any hope for us who've sinned in these areas? And, and as I said, one way or another, that's every one of us. No one's righteous here. We all have a lot to repent of here. And and the more so is we remember it's not just the outward behavior, but our hearts. It all starts in the hearts. And we're guilty in our hearts. So what's the hope? Where is forgiveness? Where is cleansing? Where is purifying? Paul continues, writing to the church at Corinth, he says, And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Dear friends, know this. Christ's grace, Christ's blood is sufficient for your sins. No matter what you've done. No matter how much you've done it. No matter how long you lived in it. See your sin for what it is. Death inflicting, soul condemning, hell deserving, rebellion before a holy God. That's precisely what Jesus came for. Repent of it, acknowledge it as sin, turn from it, do whatever it takes to kill it, and then resolve by God's grace to pursue godliness in these same areas. The culture won't encourage you. God's Word does. God's Spirit does. God's people certainly should. And maybe you need the encouragement, maybe the accountability of some other believers. And that's all helpful, but ultimately it has to come from within, from a heart born again, a heart that has embraced God's grace in Jesus the grace of God, the power of Christ's resurrection at work in you, the Holy Spirit who is with you and who empowers you. It not only gives you strength to say no to sin, but assures you of God's grace and love for you, which is so much better. They lie. The world, the flesh, and the devil do not be deceived. Let's pray. Father, forgive us when we believe the lie, and sometimes our own fallen flesh wants to believe the lie. Lord, forgive us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for his righteousness for us. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Give us grace to believe the truth, to embrace the truth, to live by your truth. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus, who's paid for every sin. Thank you for making us new in him. Father, if someone here is really struggling with guilt over these things, I pray they would see the absolute sufficiency of Jesus to pay for those sins, to cover those sins, to give them his own perfect righteousness before you, and then, Father, to be encouraged to follow him in purity and holiness. Lord, you desire our sanctification. Give us, Lord, what you desire by your word and your spirit, by your new life at work within us, that we might be lights in the darkness that we might shine forth joy, Lord, in the heartache, and that we might live truth in a world characterized by falsehood and deception. All to your glory, Lord, and all to our happiness and joy in Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.